Hey there, welcome to The Uplift. We got a great show for you, a great cast of characters as well, including these, a 14-year-old who competed against adults to become the youngest national champion in a very tricky game. What is that game? We will tell you. Also, a mom worried about the future for her son with autism ends up helping countless others with her creative solution. And a high school teacher whose life was derailed by a devastating accident until a stranger delivered a powerful message. Plus, we take you to a California community that's dealt with immense tragedy, so when one of their own was experiencing loss, they rallied to help her. All that and more coming up. You're watching The Uplift. Hey there, I'm Tony DeCoppel. This is The Uplift, the show that lifts you up for at least the next 30 minutes, you and me as well. And we're gonna begin here with a mother who was worried about what her son with autism was going to do after high school. Well, after brainstorming solutions for him, she ended up creating something that's helped countless others. Here's Caitlin O'Kane. So much to give. That's how Maureen Stenko sees her son, Nick, who's on the autism spectrum. Nick is 20. And in Pennsylvania, where they live, students with disabilities can stay in school until 22 years old. But what they do after graduation is what keeps parents like Maureen up at night. I was lying in bed one night at 3 a.m. I was thinking about, oh man, what's gonna happen to him? You know, it's like, it's coming. It's like impending now. And I actually remember the saying that my father had, when you have a problem, pray like hell, then get up off your knees and do something. And that's when it popped in my head. So much to give. About three years later, so much to give is not only her mantra, it's a cafe that employs people with disabilities. Maureen teamed up with philanthropist Kathy Opperman and Nick's former therapist, Tyler Camerly, to open the restaurant in Cedars, Pennsylvania. They employ 63 people, 80% have a disability, and they work as greeters, food runners, sous chefs, dishwashers, and servers. But the cafe is not only a place to work, it's become a safe space for others with disabilities to dine. We never even took Nick to a restaurant before this cafe opened, because when we used to, it wasn't worth it, because we would spend all this money to go out to eat to be completely stressed out. This cafe has taught Nick how to sit in a restaurant because now we have a place to go where if he stands up and he starts hopping like a bunny or clapping or yelling, nobody cares. Lauren Opelt, who is hearing impaired, works at the cafe as both a hostess and a sign language teacher. I mean, if you would ask me over a year ago, two years ago, that I would be a hostess, a server, I wouldn't believe you. Um, <laughs> Because I have grown so much self-confidence. A lot of these employees I've known since the very, very beginning. And the growth I see in them, that it's just mind-blowing. Maureen didn't know if Nick would be able to work at the cafe because of his disability and extreme food allergies, but he's exceeded her expectations. I actually brought him here on Wednesday because his school was closed and he set this entire room up without me saying a word. And the level of pride in him was just incredible. Incredible is that she didn't stop there. Across the street, she also opened up a studio where they teach music, life skills, crafts, and other classes for people with disabilities. Thanks to volunteers, donors, and a little elbow grease, her prayer for her son was answered and exceeded. I did originally think that so much to give was all about Nick and others with different abilities. And what I've learned through this whole process is it's not just about Nick and other people with, with disabilities. Everybody has so much to give. Coming up, after suffering a devastating injury, a high school teacher gets a message from a complete stranger that changed his life. What did it say? You're gonna find out, coming up. A Minnesota teen recently went up against adults at a national championship and ended up beating 
all of them. So what's the game? CBS Minnesota's Barrett Lee Owen has more. No, oh, no, Queen D5. Blink. Queen takes D4. And you'll miss it. She wins it. This is the moment 14-year-old Alice Lee takes home gold at the 2024 American Cup, the youngest American female to do so. It was really great because this is actually my first big national title to win. It might be her first national title, but it's not her first time making history. She's a three-time world youth champ and most recently was named an international master. Just one of three female players in chess history to achieve that ranking. I am very happy for her. I think it's wonderful when a young person can achieve something extraordinary. Extraordinary doesn't begin to cover it. And it was also kind of a breakthrough for me because I was playing the same opponent and listening to her uh, the previous years. That opponent was 40-year-old Irina Crush, and in the chess world, she's considered the best of the best. Crush, an eight-time U.S. women's champion and two-time American Cup winner, is the first and only American woman to earn the Grand Master title. I think it's great that she has this achievement and we really treasure this moment mm -hmm. because these moments are very few in one's life. Um, but they are also built on a lot of failures, okay? Mm -hmm. It's the failures that produce the results. Failures, memorization, and a whole lot of practice. Alice spends a couple hours daily on the game, even more time when she's nearing a competition. I really like the competitive nature of it. Um, some people say that chess is kind of like a sport. A sport she plans to stick with. You know, whether she wants to take this as a career, as a profession, that's something that Alice has to choose in the future. But as, as of now, we're just grateful for the long haul. Hopefully for my entire life. G1, G5. Thank you, Barrett Leone. Billy Keenan played many roles from dad to teacher to surfer and veteran, but after a horrible accident, his world was flipped upside down until he received a powerful message from a stranger. Here's Roman Fieser with his story. Billy Keenan of Rockland County, New York, has a lot of passions. I am a U.S. Army veteran, high school history teacher, multi-instrumentalist, father of two sons, triathlete, and surfer. But on September 14th, 2013, his life changed in an instant while at the Jersey Shore. I rode that wave, fell off my board, hit my head on the ocean floor. In that moment, everything faded to black. He woke up in a hospital room two and a half weeks later. He was paralyzed from the shoulders down, and the medical team didn't expect him to regain independent breathing. I, I resemble a train wreck. But when a parent of a former student visited him at the hospital, his perspective changed. They handed Billy the phone. Detective Stephen McDonald wanted to deliver a message. Stephen had survived a shooting. He eventually forgave his assailant, but he too was paralyzed. He became a public speaker, preaching the importance of forgiveness, and he had advice for Billy. It was at a time where I didn't have my speaking valve in, so I couldn't talk to him. Billy says Stephen was a living saint because what he told him changed everything. When you're better, when you're stronger, when, you're, when your rehab is over, you're going to come back and contribute in a significant way. And just remember, and don't ever forget, that in the end, there will be life. There will be life. There will be life. With Stephen's message about life in his head, Billy looked back on his life. A former army lieutenant and paratrooper, he realized he had been accustomed to what he calls deliberate discomfort. Never knowing that I would need those times, that evidence of resilience, you know, my experience as a soldier, and then, like, my experience as a dad. Thanks to his own faith and a reminder from Stephen, Billy overcame the odds. Four months after his accident, he was able to breathe on his own again. You know, if you look at that picture, you would never think that that guy was going to be able to breathe again. And you would never think that that guy was going to be able to teach again. In 2015, Billy went back to teaching. And when Stephen died in January 2017, Billy decided to start helping others, just like Stephen had, by becoming a motivational speaker. He also published an autobiography in 2023, The Road to Resilience, The Billy Keenan Story. With the energy I have left, um, you know, try to be there as a steward and as a, a light of inspiration for, you know, the human family. He believes that day in the hospital, Stephen delivered him a message from God he needed to hear. I've come to realize that that conversation 
those words were not coming from Stephen. They were coming through Stephen. They were coming through Stephen. I truly believe that he was the messenger from God to save a terribly lost soul. Coming up, how a woman-led construction company is focusing on deconstructing and making the business more eco-friendly. Building and tearing down homes can lead to a ton of waste, but one construction company in Colorado is deconstructing that approach. Here's CBS Colorado's Gabriella Vidal. It's a site. We take a surgical approach to demolition. You don't often see or hear. We're essentially unbuilding the house, dismantling it and sorting the material as we go. Anna Perks is the owner of Perks Deconstruction, a Commerce City business that's taking sustainability to new heights. About 40% of our landfill consists of construction and demolition material, and a lot of it is good reusable materials. But when her company gets involved in tearing down a home like this in Erie. So all the cabinets, doors, fixtures, finishes, that'll all get donated and reused as those items. And then a lot of the wood we're salvaging um, at our warehouse each piece of material. Other lumber that can't be reused, it'll get made into mulch. This is all stuff that'll get recycled. Has a renewed purpose. We have over 8 billion people on the planet and we're using resources faster than we can regenerate them. And so this is a way for us to recover materials and give it another life um, as something else. I think it puts us in a different mindset to where we're reusing rather than just trashing. Since this female-owned business kicked off, Perks says they've salvaged over 6.5 million pounds of material from the landfill. As more municipalities across Colorado are moving towards making it a requirement for construction and demolition projects to salvage existing material. Denver's moving in that direction and Lakewood, Fort Collins has a couple recycling requirements in Pitkin County. And with recent grant funding from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, Perk says they hope to take deconstruction across the metro to new heights. So the first grant allowed us to buy a pickup truck and our roll-off truck so that we're able to actually sort material on the job sites. And the second grant that we received helped us fund and start up our reclaimed lumber warehouse. It's that critical support that's helping her team support keeping Colorado greener. Helping to give things another life, which reduces the amount of resources that we have to pull from, from the earth. Love that story. A team of barbers is coming up in a moment is taking to the sidewalks in Southern California to give haircuts to people who can't pay for them. Let's do the story now. Here's Elise Martinez. One Sunday a month, you'll find Joshua Massey giving out fresh cuts. You got a big family. And conversation on the streets in downtown Redlands. But his clients can't pay. Knowing where to sleep. Most of them are homeless, including Devin, who's been living on the streets for 10 years. So he wanted to keep his hair long on the top, but he just wanted a nice clean fade on the sides. So that's what we did. Massey started Street Shaves two years ago and now has a team of five barbers and volunteers who help him help others see themselves in a new light. Thank you so much, man. Hopefully you run into each other again. These haircuts don't just change their appearance. None of us are better than anyone else, though, man. This homeless man says it makes him feel human again. Better chances all around and, and for me to feel better about me. Massey says Street Shaves has opened his eyes and he's realizing that he's getting more out of these encounters than he gives. Um, when you're living on the streets, um, when you're struggling with addiction, uh, mental illness, that's a really dark place um, and they really don't have an opportunity to to feel seen, heard, or loved. And that's our goal, you know, just being, just to be an extension of the love and the grace that we have been given um, and just to be a light in the darkest places. really matters. Coming up, how a community rallied together to help one of its own after her beloved pet was stolen. The town of Paradise, California, that is, suffered huge losses when it was ravaged by wildfires back in 2018. But when one of the residents recently experienced another loss, the community rallied to help her. Here's David Begnell. In the foothills north of Sacramento, California, people understand 
loss in a way that many of us never will. They know about big losses because in 2018, a windswept wildfire leveled the landscape, killing 85 people. So here in particular, a seemingly little loss becomes a big thing. So you got out, walked in, got what you needed, and then you come out and, and the car's I, gone. I was sure that my truck's been stolen and the immediate need is my cat's in there. Yeah. Susie Hefferman's cat, named Dundee, was a victim of a crime. A feral cat she became devoted to after she rescued him six years ago. But he was taken from her locked truck after a visit to the vet. It was just so quick, off they both went. Hmm. Took it and ran. Yeah. What happened next brought out the best of a community that was obliterated in and around Paradise, California. Susie Heffernan was one of the thousands of people who lost everything in that wildfire. Um, all the property and a little under 1,200 acres. You know, everything. It's, it's the history in the house and my grandmother's journals and, you know, you can't replace. So losing Dundee is not just a sad story of a lost cat. It is a story of character in this community. I received a message online that um, the cat might have been spotted in Chico at a homeless camp. Pamela Beasley, who makes it her business to feed feral cats every day at her own expense, became a first responder. And this was like 11, 12 midnight that night. So I went to the homeless camp. I walked through the camp, couldn't find them. The message she received had come from Tara Ramelli. My first intuition was if we could start getting on some very popular sites here in the community, that would be the best bet. Chicka chickies. So I was out on a hike, and so I answered my phone, and we immediately turned around because um, the thought was to go get Susie. Jocelyn Dunning became a part of the team known as Team Dundee. We all had our own ideas about what we thought happened. Carol Curtis, a photographer, picked up Susie, who was stranded in the parking lot. Some of us believed perhaps somebody saw the cat, picked it up. I always had a funny feeling that the boyfriend stole the car and the girlfriend thought the cat was warm and cuddly. But in the process, everybody was out searching. Pam was going back with her connections that she made at the homeless camp. Jocelyn was helping Susie, you know, drive around because we were getting calls that possibly it was Dundee. Then the next day, police found Susie's truck, 20 miles from where it was stolen. But Dundee was gone. What was the loss of the cat like? Horrible. His pills and his receipts were in front of him down on the floorboard. He needs those pills. He needs, he needs, you know, to be monitored. I just want to make sure that we got these out. Tara Ramelli posted a $500 reward and people responded. One fellow put on Facebook that he would give $1,000 of his own money. The momentum and even offers of money kept on. Yeah. Pam kept searching the encampments. Oh, it was scary. It was scary. But we're mountain people. <laughs> we're living around people that are very capable and very critical thinkers. And it's just so great to have the support like we do here. Then four days into their unrelenting search. Phone rang. Saturday night, and, stormy. And the woman says, I have your cat. And I was shocked because it wasn't, I think I have your cat. And we jump in the car and there was a person there meeting us at a certain address. It was him? It was him. And he purred to me immediately. Dundee the cat is home again. Team Dundee agreed that the money that came in should pay for food so Pam can feed more feral cats. The drools. And for this place that has survived the deadliest wildfire in California history, Team Dundee is board. not going wow. away. One, One two, three, two, three, Dundee! <laughs> Perhaps because it's always been there. Team Dundee probably came about long before Dundee got lost. I mean, there's 
there's always going to be certain members of a community that have a purpose for whatever it might be. That's because in this place, the lessons learned are extra special, but the odds of being found or found alive remain rooted in 2018. It's something I remember well from covering the fire. Ready? Yeah. Three, two. And in the end, it's not about the cat or the car. It's about the community of characters who are examples for all of us of what a community with character looks like. That is our show because that is David Begnaud. He always hits clean up. I hope it brightened your day, lifted you up. If for some reason it didn't, reruns are free. Go ahead and press play. I'm going to find some good news.